Well, we have been trying to plan this one for quite some time. Dr. Kate Truitt, uh, it is so good to see you. You and I know each other personally from the Havening world. And I think the last time we actually saw each other in person was April of 2022. Here we are in 2023 and a lot has happened in your life. One of which being this amazing book that came out. We're going to talk about that in a second. But first, I just want to say Happy New Year. What is new and good? Happy New Year to you. What is what is new and good? Hey, just us here doing this. We've been talking about this for so very long. And the the joy and the opportunity of looking at trauma and resilience and humor and how all of those things dovetail together. So this right now is my what is new and good. And of course, as you just said, the book. It's just incredible journey bringing that to the world. Yeah, this has been something that the Havening community has been waiting for. We've been hearing about it for quite some time. And as we continue to share this journey with Havening techniques, educate and give people the tools to, once they have that education, to be able to self-apply, self-soothe, self-regulate. And I think that's what's so empowering about this work is that it does put the power of emotional active as Dr. Rudin says, Dr. Steve says, active emotional well-being into your hands. And seeing a book like this come out, so you have this new book that just recently was released, Healing in Your Hands, well, well titled, Self-Havening Practices to Harness Neuroplasticity, Heal Traumatic Stress, and Build Resilience. And good goodness, we need that so much. So to be able to have a book like this in your hands, right, is powerful. So Literally. What exactly? So what exactly is this book giving to people? What are what are you actually sharing with people within the pages of this book? That there's the you know, logistical response and then there's the human response. The, the the logistics of the book is it's an accessible guide to understanding those wacky human moments that we all have, moments of reactivity or where we're beating ourselves at, moments where we're being extremely unkind to ourselves or struggling to be in partnership with people we love. And understanding the neuroscience of that while also teaching practical tools to help heal through those moments going all the way back across the course of one's life. And acknowledging that all of those moments ultimately came through our brain's deep desire to ensure our survival. And that through that lens of our brain always has our back, there's space for the shame and the guilt to step back because we feel as humans, and we're actually guided to feel this way in terms of our societal structures, guilty and shameful when we behave in ways that aren't you know, societal norms. And when we have the space to go, oh, that's just my brain, and here's the tools to help my brain heal, then we truly are empowered to create the world we want to live in. The idea being that we heal the past, create the future, or heal the past, build the present, and create the future. The, the personal response is me looking at my 11-year-old self, my 10-year-old self, who was desperately depressed and anxious and going, God, what did that little young being need? My 16-year-old self. What did she need? What information? Now, it's written for adults and teens. We've had a lot of teens who've been working with the tools and love it. Uh, and just really keeping that in mind. How do we help those young beings inside all of us to yeah. start to proactively heal? Yeah. And we all deal with that. I mean, every single one of us goes to that inner child. What part of us is showing up in this moment? Which how old are we in this space? And it's also not just the thoughts we're having that are impacting us, but really it's what we attach to those thoughts, right? That really make the impact. And I think that's a big distinction is what the attachment to the thought is rather than the thought itself. And as we know, as Havening practitioners, that this is mind alternate, altering work, you know, and being able to change your thoughts, moods, behaviors, and habits in minutes with this work is so empowering to know that we're, we're not the ones empowering others, but being able to put those tools in the hands of those we serve to empower themselves, mm -hmm. right? This is about empowering people to do their own healing work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as a psychologist, I know that sounds weird because, you know, I talk to a lot of my colleagues about our job security is people staying in our office, that that's actually the anti-ethos right. of the way my team and I operate. 
our ethos is we're supposed to be out of business in people's lives. And here's a really powerful, beautiful, and I'm very proud of the book. I will say it's beautifully written way, a, a manual of saying, you've got this. You, you truly have healing in your own hands. You're capable of it. And here's, here's the guidebook for you to step into that space for your own life. I love that you put it that way. And I don't think I've ever heard anybody else say that. And I say that a lot to clients that my job is to never have to see you again, right? Like keeping people small, keeping people sick, keeping people having to come back to us is not what, what we're in this for. We're in to help people on their healing journeys, right? But there's always a need for more. So even while you might heal whatever that upset is there's always a known there's always the factor that you can come back if you need something else and i guess i want to talk about trauma a little bit because obviously a book like this or just teaching people how to self-soothe self-haven is not something you want to use for the bigger upsets that happen in your life when we talk about trauma and as we know trauma is such a buzzword now that sometimes is overused and not used well uh, or correctly when you're working in the trauma space, as we do, when you're dealing with deep rooted trauma, that's not really where this comes into play. This is for the everyday upsets, right? So can we elaborate on the difference? Absolutely. And I think what one of my main goals, and I think I know one, I know one of my main goals in writing this book was to break through the barrier and acknowledge that there are a lot of people who have and live within a lot of pain and don't have resources or access to therapy, to support, to what they really need to be able to heal. And so that idea of being resilience focused is critical because we can live and survive through a lot of difficult moments. That doesn't necessarily mean that we have to dive into the darkness to start to create the life we want to live in the here and now. So while we're recognizing that we have what we call the case for survival, our cognitions, our autonomic response, the body response, the somatosensory kind of introceptive elements in our emotional states for how we're surviving in the moment, we can heal and shift and utilize the brain's innate healing program to build a new thriving focus case for self without having to dive into the darkness or the deep traumas of our past. And, and that's what my hope for this book is, is to create that space, especially for those who don't have access, because that is, as we know, the majority of the world. Therapy, coaching is a privilege. Unfortunately, it is not, mental wellness is not a right. It should be. And so how do we start to create the space that it is? Mm. I love how you put that. That's beautiful. You call this CPR for the amygdala. I use this a lot and I do love to reference you on that because that is brilliant. But when we talk about the amygdala, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, you know, that's the, that's that little girl there. I always think of the amygdala, like a little girl that falls and skins her knee and she needs to be picked up and told you're okay. You're okay. And the, the Amy can be anything to anyone. Right. But when you talk about CPR for the amygdala, tell me where you were going with that. So CPR for the amygdala was a brainchild that started unnamed probably back in the early, early 2015. Oh. And I, I was sitting with a client who had had a very, very acute traumatic event. She was assaulted and had been living with the repercussions of that for about six months and developed very severe agoraphobia. Now, one of the things we know about havening, especially when it comes to using havening with acute trauma, is that it can be very, very fast. And we had this incredible 90-minute session, and then she went back into her life. Now, with complex trauma, we know it's not that simple. Hmm. But with an acute trauma, and she had a very strong, resilient background, great. But... Then she called me up and said, hey, you know, I'd like to come in for a follow-up session. Now, that, that's cool. A lot of times people have those amazing breakthrough mm -hmm. one session and they're kind of done. Okay, work's done. I'm good. And I get an email going, that was amazing. Thanks. See you later. Mm -hmm. And she walked back into my office and said, you talked to me a lot about my brain in a way that I've never been talked to before. And I really want to understand how to make sure this doesn't happen again. 
Mm. Because life is hard. Things do happen. And the worst part of all of this was my brain took control. And I know even from living with PTSD for five years, having already been a trauma expert, having even that tiny bit of space of knowing why things were happening was critical to me surviving, even though the PTSD persisted. And so we sat in in another 90 minute session building out what has now become a resilient brain care program, which we detail a lot in the book. And it's this very specific intentional relationship with oneself, one's neurology and one's brain of being in very deep loving relationship with the amygdala, which we do lovingly call Amy. Mm -hmm. And I I think of Amy as a fierce warrior, maternal protector. Mm. She's always looking out for us, no matter what. It's just sometimes she needs some new tools. Mm -hmm. And so our job in relationship with our own amygdala is to say some new tools might be needed here in a moment of trauma or hijack and recognizing that if our amygdala has hijacked us, if we're dissociated, if we're panicked, if we're aggressive or angry and or ruminating and cycling, our little friend Amy, the amygdala needs some extra love. She needs CPR because what do when our body's in a state of crisis and there's a personal element to this of I couldn't save I'm a widow as, as I know you know but or your listeners may not and I couldn't save my fiance's life despite ministering CPR and you know and there was the whole thing he died a week before our wedding we've been together for 10 years and my entire world crashed down and when I reflect back to my young self at 29 30 33 35 living with PTSD going what did I need my brain in the throes of PTSD needed CPR mm-hmm. and then sitting with Dr. Steve Rudin and talking about this concept and we it's funny because we'll throw he thinks I created the title I think he created it I, we just we had this of CPR creating personal resilience for the amygdala it's brilliant and I I have to tell you every time I, I share that with people clients potential clients just in general use it in workshops or speaking engagements people get it people get that You know what I'm saying? Because we can go into the whole brain and, and, and get into the neuroscience. But I think for the most part, from what I see, is people just want to feel better. You know, they want to feel better. My brain's in crisis. Yeah. I just, I can't be in chaos anymore. I need to find the calm and we can't find the calm and the chaos. So how do you do that? You, you, it's CPR, right? And so whoever came up with it, one of the Rudins (laughs) or Kate Truitt, I think it's just the, the the beauty of, and this is going back to also the Haven and community too, you know, we're not a huge community, uh, is that we support each other in this because really anyone that's doing this work, I feel just in my own experience is really doing it for the reasons of wanting to help others on their healing journeys. You know, that's just what I see within our community as Havening practitioners. And for you to touch on going back to what you just mentioned about your fiance, I wanted, I want to talk about that because, and I appreciate you being so open about this. I know I've heard this story before, but for the listeners of Holistically Speaking, can you talk about that trauma in your life a little bit and how it's moved you more into this space of wanting to help people on their healing journeys? Yeah, absolutely. And it's still a, it, it's a, it was a powerful and moving experience as trauma and loss is for anybody. Uh, and the, the, the context of what happened is uh, my, my John, we called him Johnny Angel. Um, we met when I was 19 and he, in many respects, became a, a critical reparative figure in my own trauma healing journey from complicated things that I'd survived previously. And he, when he was about 30 years old, started becoming very unwell and we didn't know what was going on and kind of orphan illness, if you will, and was in a lot of severe pain and started abusing medication and unbeknownst to us and to his family, his friends, 
And ultimately I, I did identify that that was what was going on and actually called the wedding off and told him he had to go to treatment. And I'll never forget that conversation because I, I took the engagement ring off. We'd been together for 10 years at that point. And I, I put it on the table and between us. And I said, that these are the rules because I'm scared. And, I, and I'm, I'm to the point now where this is bigger than both of us. And, and he actually walked out and left. He got in his car and drove away. And it, it was, he came back. And, and one of the things I still try to navigate in my own life is the missed data point of he left first. But a week later, he accidentally overdosed before we could get him into treatment. And the, the acquiescence that I made was we'll get married. And then rather than going on our honeymoon, you'll go straight into treatment. And that was my capitulation to get him to agree to treatment. And windows of life are so small. Thank you for sharing that. I've, I've heard you share this story a couple of times, but I think every time I hear it, and especially the circles you're in, you've become much more open about certain elements of it. So does that help you in your healing to share a little more and more? Yeah. I, th I think uh, the, it, it does because it's that idea of wounds into, wounds into wisdom and pain into empowerment of the, the main mantra in my head when this all happened was there has to be meaning to this. And had that not happened the journey of my life and the way my life is today never would have unfolded. I, I would not be even capable of living in the world I'm living in because I didn't understand that I had to swan dive back into the darkness because my healing was built upon somebody else. And that was a forcing function for me to actually find my own strength and to stare at my culpability, my choices, my res take responsibility and acknowledge my very real humanness, which had been at the core of everything I'd been trying to teach my patients already, at, at having already been doing this work and being a psychologist, but I hadn't really been forced to go into the deepest spaces of my own soul and stare at that. Yeah, at, at that time when you were, you were already working in, in health and mental health, were you dealing with trauma work as much? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I started studying fear learning paradigms back when I was 20, 21, mm -hmm. working in rat labs. Yeah. Um, I, I found humans to be quite scary, ironically, given everything I'm doing these days. Um, <laughs> but I had debilitating social anxiety, but, and I really wanted to understand the brain. And so I started working in rat labs, studying fear learning and trying to understand what the heck was happening in my own brain every time I tried to communicate with another human and instead would be a wash of panic and fear. Would you say Johnny Angel is one of your greatest teachers? I would say Johnny Angel has been a great teacher. Yeah. I think life is the greatest teacher. Yeah, definitely. So from that story, which you so openly and beautifully share, which I want to thank you, by the way, um, that, that, that idea of really going deep into the trauma work. And I know you're working on a second book now, and we can talk about that in a second, but before we go there, I just want to remind listeners that Dr. Kate Truitt is graciously sharing space with me as it is always a pleasure to be in the room with you, which we get to do in June when we're uh, heading to Dublin yeah. to speak at the Global Havening Conference. I'm looking forward to that, but I'll take what I can get. Mm -hmm. And she's joining us here to talk about her book that she just recently released in the fourth quarter of the, the year, which is really, I mean, while there are Havening books out there and, and, doc, and the doc, both Dr. Rudin's, we've seen the books. There's, there's a couple other uh, pieces of literature out there. This is really a book that 
would you call it an instruction guide in a way? I mean, can we go there? What, what would you technically call this book? And, yeah, a man, manual. It's a neuroscience-based manual. manual. Yeah. Um, and but it, and it's also not written like a usual instruction manual because it's really easy to read. That's the number one piece of feedback I get from people. Even people in our own community and my own professional colleagues are, I can hand this to a patient. I thought this would be a scientific book because they see me teach and train and lecture. And they're like, I'm giving this to my patients like it's candy. Mm. Because any sit with this and immediately put it into action. Yeah. And again, going back to just thinking about my own traumatized brain for five years, I wish mm. I'd had an instruction manual. Mm. Of, I'm having a panic attack. How do I help my brain right now? Because my brain's in crisis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing I can do. CPR for the amygdala. Got it. Cool. Yeah. So healing in your hands, self-havening practices to harness neuroplasticity, heal trauma, stress, and build resilience. All so important. So it's a long title, it's I a, know. But, but <laughs> everything in there is like, everything in there is the meat and potatoes of what we really need. You know, it really is. And being able to put this in people's hands literally, and then also use havening in your hands, literally, is is really empowering, like I said. So just for listeners, we're going to put the link to where you can find the book. There's a number of different places. I know you're working very closely with PESI as well. You're working with, um, you know, you can find it on Amazon. You can find a number of places. And we'll just put the links in there so people can grab it and start using it today. And of course, you can always get in touch with Dr. Dr. Kate. Uh, she has her own. You have Viva Excellence, which, which is where you're creating curriculum. I mean, there's no, there will be no way that you can't get in touch with her. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> Besides giving your phone number. <laughs> I'm going to quickly plug just because I think this is one of the most fun things. It's yeah. going back to what, what is good and new that I started yeah. last year is the TikTok channel oh, of course. where I respond to people's questions. Mm -hmm. So go to the channel. If you have a question about neuroscience or trauma or mental health or psychology. Post your question and I'll do a video, you know, one to three minutes long and reply. I love that. And it's how do we empower people. Absolutely. Knowledge is power. And TikTok's gonna, it's kind of been a new thing for me too, but it's such a great space to share. And, you know, we're not mm -hmm. dancing on these videos, as you know, there's, there's plenty of people oh, doing God. that, but, <laughs> but maybe we should do a dancing video together at the global Haven and conference. No, no. Okay. Okay. We can do something. We can do the robot <laughs> <laughs> date ourselves, but I, I, I agree with you. Like my, my space there as well is about being able to give people the tools, educate them in different areas, but not educate it where it's like pushing it down their throat, like really giving people the opportunity to share. So we will share your TikTok talk. Absolutely. You also have your Instagram. We'll put all of those links in the, the podcast listen notes so people can get in touch with you and also just connect with you, you know, and I know you have your YouTube as well. So on that note, I'd love to move on to the second book, which I did not know about. And this kind of plays off of what you were yes. just talking about with Johnny Angel, about what she went through, um, going back to the child, going back to the younger years. And uh, I'd love for you to elaborate on that, because the minute you put out one book, you're already working on another. You need a vacation. <laughs> yeah, well, and <laughs> <laughs> I, I hear that a lot. I hear that a lot. Yeah. So, so the second book actually is a book that I started writing prior to this book. And mm -hmm. the when, when I was approached to write this book by a couple of different publishing houses, I gently and lovingly put the other book aside and I, I had I'd gone through a couple drafts of it. The, the second book, which is titled Keep Breathing, mm -hmm. is, is a case study in understanding the brain science of trauma, of suicidal considerations, mm -hmm. of living in the throes of deep grief, and also building the case for a new way forward for Thrive, resilience, personal empowerment, and strength. And the case study is told through the lens of my story. So the book mm -hmm. opens up with eulogy at my fiance's funeral on what literally would have been our wedding day mm -hmm. and the journey through that process and really take it. It's been a 
it's been hard and beautiful and also beautiful to write, to revisit these parts and to also look at it through the lens of here I was again, as somebody who'd been already specializing and studying the neuroscience of trauma for so long, who was still felled by trauma. And so it really was just being is whiplash with the hubris of my education and really the, the ultimate truth that just because we know something doesn't mean our mind and our body feel it. Yeah. And hmm. so knowledge is power. And then how, the, and that takes us back to what this book, is, the healing in your hands book of, and here's how to help the mind and body build a synthesis to deepen that. Has writing been a therapy for you in itself? It has been. Yeah. I, I started, I started writing my first book when I was like 10. So writing and reading have always been a survival strategy. For yeah. Me. Yeah. How is it for you as an adult writing? Like what, what makes it different from the 10 year old Kate? My vocabulary is bigger. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, it, you can do it, legal it, things it, that you couldn't do before. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, it's cr- the, 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 the mission and the vision and the purpose of the writing. Yeah. It's yeah. why, why am I curating the stories? What is my, the larger, why the bigger purpose mm. behind it? And what's my hope for what this book could give to even just one person. Yeah. If it just makes a difference to one. It's definitely going to be a challenge. Really? Absolutely. I, I love that. What, um, what are your hopes? I mean, what, here's, here's a question I meant to ask you earlier when we were talking about healing in your hands. And I guess this actually, this plays the same, it plays well with keep breathing as well, but how are these books different from others that are similar out there on the market or the one that's soon to be with keep breathing? Mm-hmm. What makes them different? I think, well, one, one big thing is they're, they're certainly written much more in the style of Brene Brown's work. Mm. Uh, the expert using self as an exploratory question rather than the expert being an expert. Because I'm not an expert. Life's an expert. You, every human is an expert on themselves. I just have some knowledge about some things that sometimes may be helpful to people. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's what shifts and, and it's just been changing. Like Dr. Ariel Schwartz is really beautiful and encompassing this space of inviting in and taking the quote unquote doctor off the table mm-hmm. and really and then saying, we're just as human. And what if we shone a light on that mm-hmm. and utilize that as the actionable space for learning? sharing that internal space within our own heads, not the heads of our patients, but instead going as humans, here's things. Mm. And you're not alone if you're feeling these things, because I feel them and Susie next door feels them. And my, you know, my husband feels them and Hillary feels them. And Mm. that's because we're human and we're human and there's connection and beauty within that. Mm. And I think that also goes back to, and I've heard this, before in a number of different seminars and workshops that we're more than the LMNOPs after our name. We're more than what the MD, the PhD, the HT, whatever is after your name. We are so much more than that. When it comes down to it, we're human beings. We have feelings, we connect, we emote, we feel. And when we go back to the basics of that, which really in a lot of ways just reminds me, I had a conversation with my brother uh, the other day, who's very much into the Buddhist philosophy as a, um, uh, uh, a martial artist, you know, and talking about the mandala and getting to the center of the mandala is the existence of everything. Like that's like, you're either at the spoke of the wheel way out there hanging on for dear life. But as you get closer, you're, you're more aware, right? We want to be more aware of how to meet and can be compassionate and, I love when I have those kind of conversations because it's a reminder to self that it really is our goal to get to the center of the the wheel and not hang out so much around the spokes, right? Um, because yeah. that's where we are. There's no elemental peas over here. 
right? This is the ego. Yeah. Ego's gone, yeah. right? But to to speak with someone like yourself, to have a conversation with someone who is a high level in in you know you have you do have a lot of LMNOPs after your name, or or even just one, but you have a high level education. That doesn't mean. And you're very humble about this. It doesn't mean you're better than someone that didn't even graduate high school, right? Because we're all learning yeah. from each other, you know? Mm-hmm. And but we but when somebody is like you, Kate, and is so compassionate and empathetic and just a joy to, to be around and speak to, that's what makes it so much easier to connect with somebody like yourself because of that, you know? And how does that come into play with keep breathing? I think that's one of the core elements is a large part of what I try to do in all my social media and all my writings is to, this this might sound weird, so go with me for a minute, (laughs) but to to leverage, leverage my privilege, Mm -hmm. because it is a, it's a privilege that I have been able to have the level of education that I have. And it's leveraging that privilege to tell a story. And it's a story that can hopefully be helpful if even just for one person so that that life feels less alone or isolated. That life understands the nature of suicide and suicidal considerations better. That that person recognizes the struggle with addiction in a different way and understands why the brain's doing the thing. And my privilege is the the brain's doing a thing. That's the education. Mm -hmm. And then honor is the, and I'm a human telling a story. Yeah. I'm bringing those. Together. We're all sto- storytellers, right? We all have a story to share. And as you had said before, you know, everything's a lesson. It's so true. Like that's one of the reasons why I do this, this show. And I've been doing it for so long is that it, everybody has something, the mess that they can turn into the message, the trauma into the triumph. And if we can learn from those moments that, that is the rock of fuel that makes make is the distinction as to what am I going to do with it? You know, am I going to take this with me somewhere? Or am I just going to bury it away? But when it's buried away, we don't really do with it. I'm not saying you have to talk about it to nauseam. People deal with things differently, but to give people an opportunity to realize that this is your story, but it doesn't have to be your new narrative, right? That's the big difference, you know, and um, I love that you share so openly and eloquently about that. And just a reminder, if this, if to those listening, if this conversation has touched, moved and inspired you in any way, which I can't imagine how it couldn't, you know, pass it along to somebody else. We've, we've covered a lot of ground here. And I imagine there is a one person in your life to the dear listener out there that this will impact somebody else. So pass it along, share it, you know, leave your thoughts about it and, and let us know that, you know, holistically speaking is making a difference as well. Just having this platform for people like Dr. Kate Truitt, who can share here a dear friend who is opening her heart and, and your story to be a part of this, the process, the healing process, really. And thank you the world it's it's truly a gift and thank you it's a lot of time and effort and commitment and we we link arms and we do this together so true i love that one thing i do want to ask you about that we didn't touch on and this is kind of off this is really and this might be work to you as well but i know you're a horse lover and i know you have your baby how much is your life as an equestrian and having a horse, a part of your therapy. Cause I used to work in hippotherapy and uh, equestrian therapy. And I love to do that. I hope to get back into it I, before I was even in Havening. And I saw the transformation of how it helped the, the kids that I was working with that were on the spectrum or anybody dealing with PTSD. How much a part of that is in your life? Well, I am an equine certified psychotherapist. <laughs> so uh, that, that says something right there. Big part. Um, <laughs> the, yeah, horses throughout my childhood were my safe space. That I could go to the barn. Yeah, you know, I grew up in the Midwest, so that was just a bike right away, <laughs> and be with a creature that does not allow for pretense. Horses are they're prey creatures, and so it is authenticity or nothing. And they can read a human or a situation better than humans can hopefully someday dream to read a situation. 
And to this day, my giant baby, um, I adopted a racehorse. Uh, he was just a little too slow. Uh, when I adopted him four years ago, he was largely emaciated. And we didn't quite know who would show up once he started to feel better and started to be nourished and loved and cared for. And he's just the best, best horse in the entire world. And he's the most humbling teacher I could ever ask for. Because if I'm being inauthentic, if I'm being unclear, if I'm not present with him, he will let me know. And he weighs about 1,700 pounds. He's almost, he's seven over 17 hands. He's huge. And I was just going to ask you how many hands. That's a yeah, big boy. A big, big boy. And I mean, I'm 5'10 for context for your listeners if you don't speak horse. And right. uh, my horse is with, <laughs> just above my head. So he is very withers in the shoulder blades before the next start. So he's very, very tall and very mm-hmm. strong. And he will let me know when I'm not showing up. And it is the most humbling, powerful teacher mm-hmm. in my life that allows me to be a way better version of myself for my partner, for my team, for my friends, my colleagues, my parents, my family. It's, he does not deal. He does not do BS. Well, and when you're when you're around something that big, mm-hmm. you know not to show up with the BS. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Right. Yep. Horses are amazing. Yeah, horses, dolphins, as we know, Judith Prager talks about that. Dr. Prager and her attachment to Mateo, who is another wonderful person in the Havening community. Uh, but just animals in general, like there is such a I know that and I have a cat now. I don't have uh, Eliza. People know my, my little Eliza that, that animals show up for you. You know, and they, they're the litmus test for stress. They're the litmus test for like any emotion you're having. Mm-hmm. And, but there are certain creatures that I think really connect with humans, horses and dolphins, dolphins. being the two. Yeah. And, dogs too. and, and, and just, yeah. And, and just seeing how these animals connect, especially um, being a, a equestrian therapist as well and you and i both know that seeing this happen firsthand how how they are so nurturing with somebody who might need additional support Absolutely. is quite amazing to witness yeah it's 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 wonderful yeah. and, and another um dr carol robertson in the havening community mm-hmm. it's a lot of integration yeah. with havening and horses and uh, on a larger scale we know that work equine therapy is an incredibly powerful trauma modality havening included or not Mm-hmm. because of that mm-hmm. mirror and just to plug a quick book, I have no affiliation, but the Tao of Equus phenomenal, mm. absolutely beautifully phenomenal book diving into the introspective reflective nature between horses and humans. Well, I love when my guests come on and have their favorite books. I was actually <laughs> going to ask you if there's a book that you're reading right now, but whether it's, whether you've read it or you're reading, is there something you're reading right now? Uh, you know what? There is something that I'm reading right now and it is the modern trauma toolkit. It is not yet out. Uh, it will be published in May and I've been invited to do a review. It's do- uh, Dr. Christy Gibson, who is known as the TikTok trauma doc on TikTok. Who is just absolute yes. gem and a brilliant, brilliant physician up in Canada, trauma informed practitioner, healer, and she has written an incredible anthology to how to not similar parallel to healing in your hands, how to bring these tools into your day to day life. Mm. And it's, it's absolutely beautiful. And I cannot wait for it to hit the market so that we can all buy it and celebrate it because it's yet another f- approach that is the mm. same framework how do we put healing in your own hands because we are all capable of it and here's another guidebook to do that. it's beautiful that's what i love about you and just people that think that way is that there's abundance right there are so many people that need support that it's not about i'm taking away from somebody else or i you know there there are people that think like that i imagine but to, to come from the place of there's plenty of people out there that can use the support of you or me, or maybe they just vibe with, with the different energies. I mean, it is all about alignment, you know, and being able to refer and being able to say, maybe there's something about that person that just aligns with you more than this one. Maybe they both align in the perfect, perfect fashion, but to know that there's, there's an abundance, there's always enough for all. 
whatever side of the coin you're on, you know? And so sharing that is, is wonderful. The book's not out yet, but I'll still add it to the notes. <laughs> yeah, I'll, send, I'll send you the link on the website for it. And then, but it, it, yeah, I love it. And then also, yeah, to the, the equestrian book as well. Yeah. To the point of abundance, it's so many brains align with different voices. Yeah. So it, it's more about, it's that linking of arms. The more we link arms together and can support mm. and build a empowered community of like-minded healers and wisdom bringers and dedicated individuals who are driving towards the purpose of doing whatever little bit we can to help humanity be happier. Going back to the idea of humor, the more joyous we will all be. Yeah. Getting to the center of the wheel. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Love that. Okay. So let's have a little fun for a second. I want to have a little fun with you and I do this with my guests, but I'm going to throw out a word from our conversation. Okay. I take my little notes. Uh, one word, we're going to do a little word association. You're going back to school. Cause I know you're kind of, you're a neuro nerd. I know this. You've, you're, you're not quiet about it. <laughs> I know this about you, but I'm going to throw out one word. And what I want you to do is just come back real quick with the first word that comes to mind, little word association. Rapid fire. Are you ready? I'm ready. She was born. She was born ready. Okay, <laughs> here we go. Amig amygdala. Survival. Warrior. Power. Loss. Hmm. I'm not being fast. <laughs> it's like wisdom. <laughs> it's okay. You do you. Horse. Oh, love. <laughs> Breath. Life. Resilience. Strength. Trauma. Mm, darkness. Brain. Uh, capacity. Mind. Mm. That goes back to wisdom. And then havening. Mm, healing. Yeah. yeah, that that's something I thank you for sharing that. That's something I didn't ask you, but uh, there is a difference between the brain and the mind. Oh, they're huge. And and I I would wonder if you could put that in like a brief sentence or so. What would be the difference? Because people use that that both, and sometimes it's like, are you using the right word to associate with what each thing is? So, what would make the difference between the brain and the mind? Um. The brain is the brain. I guess the simplest way I would say it is, is the brain has common f structures across all human organisms. Mm -hmm. Just like there's kidneys and there's livers and there's stomachs, there's brain. The mind is the intricacy of all of the billions of neurons and the relationships of those neurons to one another, how the different brain parts have grown or shrunk or shifted or changed based on the life experiences. Mm, like that. I just like how you put that. Um, well said. I put you on the spot with that one. Yeah. Miss Kay Truitt, I'm calling on you in the audience. Uh, tell me what the difference is between the brain and the mind. It's like being back in class, yes. right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So one thing I would love to ask you is to share with listeners, what would be your final thought that you'd like, like those listening to walk away with? Hmm. I think going back to the, the word association of trauma and darkness, we have to go into the dark corners sometimes so that we can learn and shine, light a candle and look around and see what's there. Going into the trauma can be very empowering and also the critical caveat if you don't have to. There's so much empowered healing work that can be done without going into that space. We talk about how the amygdala can be broken. And if the amygdala is broken, the straw that breaks the amygdala's back, that's where the trauma is now guiding our lives. Going back to your very first question, the difference between life and trauma. 
But if you're living life with hard stuff and patterns and considerations that are getting in your way, that doesn't mean you have to go in and unpack all the trauma. There's so much healing work that can be done in the present and future focused space. Our brain protects us from darkness. And whether or not we go back into that darkness is actually a choice. Or can be a choice. You choose to choose. That. Yeah, we, we can choose right. to choose. Unless the amygdala has been broken. Choose to choose. Yeah. Right. But to assume that and not even try or just give it a possibility, know that you have a possibility. Yeah. I think that's a big thing, knowing we have possibilities in life, right? Yeah, we have choice. Yeah. And, and even that changes it. Choice. Yeah. Kate, this was such a, a pleasure to have you here. Uh, I can't wait to see you, give you a big hug. Yes. I right? Here we come. And um, here we come. Excited. We are off to Dublin in June for the Global Havening Conference. But before that, my friends that are listening, pick up the book, Healing in Your Hands. This is a really beautiful book that is just a self-guided tour in a way for you to be able to Put these tools in your hands. Learn more about Havening. You hear me talk about it a lot on this podcast, a lot. Podcast, media, wherever, I, you know, we're putting it out there in the world because it needs to be known so that you know this and you can use this. And when you need people like Dr. Kate or myself, sure. you know how to reach us. So I will put all that in the podcast notes. Thank you so much for being here yeah. and much love to you. And thank you for everything you do. And right back at you. Do yourself a favor and connect with Dr. Kate Truitt. Right now, I have added all of her links in the podcast notes. And if you have been sitting there doing a little self-havening while you've been listening or watching, I want you to free up your hands just for a moment. Order a copy of her book, Healing in Your Hands. This is a must-have to have in your self-care library to learn how to self-soothe, to self-regulate, and to bring more self-love into your life. And if you want to try havening for yourself, join me for my free 14 day hug it out challenge because we will be doing some havening during each of those days but there's so much more to this challenge this is a great opportunity to add some rocket fuel as we dive into this second month of the new year and that's when most people start quitting their goals their resolutions and their intentions 80 percent actually so i want you to join me to be part of the 20 percent and sign up now we start on january 30th it's free you're invited just go to hillaryrusso.com slash challenge or click the link in the podcast notes to sign up right there. And if you don't want to wait, that is fine too. Set up a complimentary call with me to learn if havening is right for you. I've also provided a link to book that session with me in the podcast notes as well. Holistically Speaking is edited by Two Market Media with music by my friend Lipbone Redding and of course, it's recorded on Squadcast every week because everyone has a story, including you. And this is a chance for you to show that your voice matters. So on that note, take a deep breath. Be kind to your mind and know that you have the tools to heal and the power is all in your own hands. Much love to you and I'll see you next week.